I'm delighted to be here, and I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Sahel and the organizers for this invitation. Denise has just given a beautiful presentation of some of the technologic developments that uh, promise to revolutionize gene therapy. And I'm going to step back and talk about an older uh, disease, that, one that's uh, been in the clinic now for more than eight and a half years. Um, and that has uh, been uh, exemplified by this uh, lovely creature here, Lancelot, who was the first dog to benefit from this um, therapy in the year 2000. And um, so this is a uh, monogenic therapy. And the current challenges that I'm going to talk about are uh, both scientific and translational, as well as practical, scientific um, in terms of outcome measures, optimizing the therapy, uh, questions about readministration, changing the goals about um, re reversing blindness versus preventing disease progression, speeding up the translational process, and then practical ones um, dealing with uh, what we anticipate will be the first approved gene therapy drug for retinal disease um, and, and how that will be uh, regulated and what the economic issues uh, might bring. And uh, before I go further, just uh, I'd like to mention my potential conflicts. Um, and I'm mentioning those of my husband as well, Albert McGuire. Uh, uh, we are both co-authors on a patent for uh, retarding the development of blindness, but we waived any potential financial gain. We carried out these studies as an academic collaboration with investigators at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And when the studies reached phase three clinical trial, uh, they were taken over by a company named Spark Therapeutics, which has since uh, given us a uh, clinical trial agreement um, funds to carry out the, these studies. And I'd like to acknowledge the team, of course, which um, is an uh, enormous group of highly um, uh, talented and, and uh, complementary uh, people um, shown here, both at CHOP and at our center, which is called CARAT, Center for Advanced Retinal and Ocular Therapeutics. So the disease uh, that I'm going to launch from is uh, Labor's congenital amaurosis, known as LCA. Um, this is an autosomal recessive early onset vision disability. Um, and in both uh, humans and the animal models, there can be nystagmus because uh, the retina is not fixing and, and uh, adjusting the uh, focus of the gaze um, as, as it is in normal sighted individuals. This is a rare disease, and it comes in multiple di different genetic flavors. There are now at least 18 different genes which, when mutated, can cause this condition. And we and others have focused on RPE65, retinal pigment epithelium 65 kilodalton protein, uh, which has been very well characterized. This is, uh, encodes an isomeral hydrolase, which is pr uh, produced in the retinal pigment epithelium. And the main job of this is to break down the esters uh, to restore the 11 cis retinal uh, to the photoreceptors in the retina so that the retinas can actually uh, respond to vision. So from a gene therapy perspective, uh, this is perhaps one of the simplest ones because the idea is that you can introduce this recombinant gene to, uh, to replace the missing function of this enzyme. And uh, it ha was identified by a number of different groups as being a good target. Um, and as Denise mentioned early on, there were three different groups uh, that began near simultaneous trials. That was in 2007. But there are now more than half a dozen uh, trials that have involved this different disease. And that actually allows us opportunity to dissect out the variables that allow for success, as I'll, I'll get into later. Most of these have, have been phase one and two trials. There is one phase three trial, and that's the one that, that we have uh, been carrying out. Um, and the number of different number of trials have involved more than 100 individuals. Uh, this particular trial here was recently announced um, and hasn't in, has enrolled yet. So there are uh, approximately 100 different in individuals who have so far received subretinal injection of AAV containing RP65. Uh, transgene, and the safety record is excellent. Uh, so the strategy is to package the recombinant, uh, the, the uh, cDNA, human cDNA for RB65 in the, 
the AAV capsid and uh, deliver that capsid subretinally so that it, the virus becomes uh, opposed to the cells that are diseased, the retinal pigment epithelium cells. This causes a localized retinal detachment which flattens down within a matter of hours so that by the next day, it's usually no longer visible. And this allows a, a high concentration of the recombinant virus to be exposed to the cells that are sick and, uh, and need the resuscitation. So the phase one, two clinical trial that we ran, and, and this is a very similar format for the other trials that have, have been carried out, was a dose escalation study with three different doses with a single subretinal injection of the AAV into the worst seeing eye. And of course, this had to be individuals who have RP65 mutations, as otherwise there'd be no chance of benefit. And as I mentioned, our current follow-up is eight and a half years. And these images reflect um, some of the outcomes that we've seen. Uh, this is an eight-year-old child, the first uh, American child that was enrolled in this study two days before his, uh, his eight-year-old birthday. And you can see he's walking through the hospital using his blind cane and holding his parents' hands. And then the same child, a year and a half after the injection, is doing clearly visual things, riding his bicycle to his friend's house, playing sports and uh, playing board games and doing uh, very visual activities. And he's now 15 years old and at his most recent visit told me that he's hunting. Typical American, <laughs> I guess, but, uh, but one would argue that hunting requires good vision, uh, um, although I'm not sure I'd want to be around to test that. <laughs> so, um, so one of the challenges that we and others faced is the um, idea of using what is a clinically meaningful outcome measure. And the US Food and Drug Administration, FDA, uh, so far has only approved drugs um, based on the improvement of reading uh, visual acuity, i.e. reading the eye chart. So three or more lines on the eye chart. And of course, for this particular disease, many of the people may not even be able to see the eye chart. So one of our challenges was to develop outcome measures which could reflect an improvement in vision. And this issue has been addressed uh, by other speakers also with respect to the, um, the retinal implants. And so uh, one of our, our measures in the dog models um, early on showed that before the gene therapy, the animals had a hard time navigating, uh, particularly in dim light, whereas after gene therapy, they could navigate without any problem. And this definitely changed their behavior. And so what, as in our um, phase one trial, one of our exploratory measures was to use a mobility course uh, where the subject had to follow a series of arrows and avoid objects that might be um, in their way, step over them, go up steps and down steps, and avoid bumping into ordinary household items and find the door at the end. And of course, the course is uh, reconfigured for each test because these individuals learn how to get around by memorizing how many steps it takes to get from point A to point B. And this shows the eight-year-old boy I, I showed you earlier um, using his uninjected eye, his injected eyes patched, and you can see he got stuck, immediately went off course, has a very hard time figuring out where to go and has to be coaxed. And if I let him let this whole video go, it would take 17 minutes for him to find the door just because he can't see the visual cues. Whereas with his injected eye, and here's his uninjected eye patched in this video, um, he goes through the course just fine. So um, this, this is a test that we have continued to use, but since it has not been validated, since it was something that we developed, we also simultaneously went through a series of validation studies so that this test um, could be used uh, not only in a phase three trial, but also in other trials uh, using other modalities to treat blinding disease. And shown here are the results of putting normal sighted individuals and visually impaired individuals who, through this course. Um, this involved more than 56 different people and, and um, the, the testing proceeded more, uh, this data is from one year, but the testing has proceeded for two years. 
And here, the, what you see by the cluster of dots is these people have passed the mobility test. And um, in the visually impaired group, the majority of the people have failed the test, as you see by these red crosses. Interestingly, uh, it's individuals with choroideremia who are able to pass this test. So this test is not good for individuals with choroideremia who have very good visual acuity, central vision, until very late in their disease. Um, we also looked at other tests that might be available. Um, one uh, group suggested to us using a visual function questionnaire 25, which was developed by the National Eye Institutes. And a sample question reads, how much difficulty do you have driving in different conditions, such as bad weather or during rush hour or on the freeway in city traffic? And it ranges, the answer is no difficulty all, at all to have you stopped doing this for other reasons or you're not interested. Well, obviously, this question is not relevant to people with congenital blindness because most of them are never going to drive. And certainly, children enrolled in a clinical trial are not driving. And so we developed our own visual function questionnaire and validated it. And a sample question would be, do you hesitate using, before using stairs or getting onto an escalator or going through a revolving door by yourself because of difficulty seeing? And the person would grade it always um, to never in, in a range uh, in between those scores. So we also did use um, standard clinical measures, and I'll get to those in a minute. But one question um, that, that we had after uh, finishing our phase one trial, uh, and a question that the subjects themselves asked us is, would it be possible to treat the second eye? Because the individuals felt they benefited from the first eye treatment and thought, wouldn't it be great to have the second eye treated as well to be able to benefit even more? And in fact, when we discussed plans for moving forward to a phase three trial, i.e. a trial that's aimed at getting the drug approved, the FDA said, well, you can't do one eye is unilateral injections. You're going to have to do bilateral injections because if this gets approved, retinal surgeons are going to inject both eyes. And so we decided it was important to test administration of AAV to the contralateral retina. But we weren't about to test this first in humans. We went back to our trusty dogs, and shown here are two of uh, the affected Briards um, that were, uh, are related to Lancelot uh, distantly, um, but obviously having the same mutation. And uh, so we went from, so I just want to point out that the whole process of improving this is reiterative, going from the clinic to the lab to the clinic to the lab. And I'm sure this will continue as additional questions are asked. But uh, so the, the question uh, pertained really to the, uh, the impact of immune response. So the AAV2 capsid is foreign. If it's injected into the eye, that could serve as an antigen and, and elicit an immune response. The question is, would it be safe to go back and re-administer the AAV2, um, um, which could uh, then have, after it's already been exposed to the body, uh, could elicit a immune response, which could prevent further benefit or uh, could actually cause harm in term, terms of inflammation. And so uh, we enrolled the affected animals as well as unaffected animals, treated them with high dose in one eye, and then three weeks later when we expected immune response to be maximal, went to the second eye, and there was no problem. And uh, these dogs um, were able to see just fine, shown here as uh, one of them going through a mobility course and obviously very visual. And, um, and these two, the dogs that I just showed you, including this one, are now living happily at our home. We've adopted them, and we call them our seeing eyes dogs. <laughs> um, so we move forward very cautiously to in, enrolling the humans who are in our uh, first, uh, in our dose escalation study. And this slide looks complicated. What it shows is the, the different doses that were administered to the uh, different groups of people. So the, these pe people shown in green got the low dose, the second cohort got the medium dose, and the third cohort got the high dose. But when the second eye was in, uh, uh, treated in this readministration study, all of these eyes got the same dose, the high dose and the, and the high volume. So this immediately eliminated a number of the variables that we had to deal with in terms of looking at effects in the phase one trial. 
And um, shown here are some of the results we've seen, looking at visual fields at baseline prior to second eye injection, and the area of the injection is shown here. This is the baseline visual field, which is essentially a point. And then after injection one year, you can see this robust visual field, um, and this continues um, through year three and counting. Um, and uh, all of the individuals are past year three, some are past year five at this point, but the effects have continued um, in the majority of the subjects. And shown here um, is another test. This is full field light sensitivity thresholds. Uh, the subject looks into a dome and presses a button when they see lights of different intensity. And uh, this is done either for white light or for chromatic light sources. And what you can see here is the eye that was injected previously, shown in green, maintains its function, whereas the eye that is getting it, the, the new injection starts at a low baseline and then increases by day 30, increases in sensitivity, and that sensitivity persists again now through three years for both uh, white light, blue light, and red light. And uh, we also looked at pupillary light reflex. At baseline, there was very minimal reflex, uh, whether the right eye was illuminated versus the left eye, very little um, response. In fact, there's a lot of nystagmus you can see here, so the re recordings are quite wobbly. After the first eye was injected, you see there's a robust response just when the, the injected eye is illuminated. But after the second eye is injected, you can see there are responses in both eyes. So yes, indeed, this is another affirmation that the, um, the intervention to the second eye also resulted in benefit. And then finally, the mobility test, um, again, showing a stabilization of the first eye. Um, and then a large and in dramatic increase in um, being able to, to carry out the mobility test, again, persisting through three years. Now, one question that has arisen in the field um, is uh, portrayed by these two uh, papers, which came out in New England Journal of Medicine a year ago, uh, by two of the other groups which initiated their phase one trial simultaneous with ours, again, doing dose escalation. And uh, one group um, used a uh, RP65 promoter, which was an excellent idea um, in terms of safety, but I don't, uh, my opinion is that this didn't have as, as robust a punch as the promoters that are using the other trials. And so perhaps this is one reason why this group did not see long-term effective gene therapy. And a second group reported on three of 15 subjects um, that were treated uh, with different doses in different areas of the retina um, with their gene therapy, showing a robust increase uh, lasting uh, three years and then slowly decreasing, but still above baseline at the three-year time point. And so there's concern uh, now that, that uh, gene therapy will not last. Um, however, I think that the answer is still pending uh, we need to continue to collect data to identify variables so that the conditions can be optimized. So as I mentioned before, the different trials um, used um, different vectors, different promoters, different doses, volumes, uh, different ex inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, some injected two different spots in the retina, others just one. Some used uh, steroids, others didn't, uh, different outcome measures. And, um, and I think the opportunity provided by readministration in our um, readministration study using one single dose, one single volume, and then analyzing individuals by uh, defined clinically meaningful measurements um, uh, and seeing persistence of the effect through three years is promising. Now, will it be sustained? We don't know. And if it's not sustained, will it be possible to readminister to the initially injected eye? This, these are uh, questions that, um, that await us. But in any case, the results of the readministration study led us to develop a phase three clinical trial. Um, and again, uh, we had to deal with uh, re uh, requirements by the FDA that some people be randomized to not receive treatment. How, and so that these individuals were followed at the same, uh, for the same number of visits as the intervention group, but then they crossed over at the one-year point and received the intervention and were analyzed. And all of the individuals have uh, gone through at least one year uh, post-intervention um, or, or post-control uh, group, 
And uh, uh, the results from, from uh, those studies have, uh, some of them have been released. Shown here is the mobility test at baseline where the subject is walking very, very tentatively um, because she can't see uh, the objects that are in her way, whereas at the one year time point, uh, she's navigating this port, uh, course accurately and quickly um, and completing it um, in a very short period of time. And graphically, um, what we see is that the, uh, is shown here from group analysis that the, the individuals who are in the control group don't receive injection for one year, do not improve in their mobility test score, whereas those that um, receive the intervention improve, improve by the day 30 visit. And there's similar improvements in light sensitivity um, used by other testing paradigms. So, um, so the bottom line is uh, the specific gene ther this specific gene therapy reagent may soon be approved um, by the U.S. FDA as uh, a medication for treatment of people with RP65 de deficiency. So there's several things that are needed, um, including a surgical training plan. There should be more genotyping so that individuals know whether or not they could pot potentially participate. Um, and continued data collection so that we continue to learn more. And, um, and then for research uh, purposes, exploratory measures should be followed if patients are willing to participate in research study, because these will also help us un better understand the pathogenesis and lead to additional outcome measures, which could be useful for other future gene therapy trials. So um, one of the challenges um, from an industry perspective is um, the importance of training people to administer the drug. Um, gene therapy delivery is not an accepted clinical procedure at present, and there is definitely a learning curve in learning how to carry out the subretinal injections. And uh, so we've partnered with Novartis to develop a training plan um, for individuals who are interested in doing this. The ma major concern is that one disaster with this compound could damage the entire field, um, as similar to what happened in 1999 when there was a gene therapy death due to um, an unexpected inflammatory reaction. And then as far as looking at uh, other exploratory outcome measures, um, uh, Issues such as this may be identified. Um, this is, was reported by Manzar Ashtari in our group who has been following the individuals in our study using ma magnetic resonance imaging, both functional and structural. And what she's found is that in the area corresponding to the treated retina, the, there is a robust thickening of the, the pathway, i.e. myelination of the neurons that are affected by treating the retinal cells themselves. In other words, with use, um, these, these circuits seem to increase in their power. And, uh, and so there are other issues related to neuroplasticity, I think, which um, are going to be very interesting. So um, I've already mentioned the readministration uh, possibilities, um, in, in particularly if, if there's a diminishment in efficacy at some point in time, or whether uh, individuals would like to have a different part of their retina treated, will it be possible to readminister to the same eye? We know now we can to the other eye without a problem. Will we get even better outcomes if, if people are treated in infancy? For example, will people be able to develop 20-20 vision um, because they're still in the, uh, the um, realm of, of uh, enjoying the plasticity? Um, or, and would eye or vision exercises be helpful for people being able to understand what they're seeing? We had the opportunity of having one of our subjects live in our house um, during the whole process where she received her intervention and, um, and um, was recovering and being tested uh, because she, she lived too far away from her home and couldn't fly back and forth uh, for, the, uh, for the various visits. And it was fascinating seeing her look at an object, for example, branches outside of the window, branches of a tree, or uh, from a car seeing a pond with the reflection of the water and figuring out what that was. Maybe there are ways where um, the, uh, the brain, um, what the understanding of the brain, um, what the, the retina is telling it can be expedited by different exercises. So um, one other challenge is how can we move forward faster? 
It took 22 years to develop this RP65 uh, gene therapy drug, um, which will hopefully be approved um, this next year. Um, but in the meantime, many people went blind um, because there was no treatment for them. And, uh, and in many cases, there are no animal models or animal models are irrelevant. So one avenue that we've explored is to be able to use induced pluripotent stem cells, which can be obtained by uh, taking a skin sample or a tissue sample, blood sample from an individual who has this genetic disease, growing these cells in culture, de-differentiating them and differentiating them then, differentiating them then into a retina-specific cell type. And then these cells can be tested for proof of concept using recombinant viruses. And after additional safety studies in wild type animals, um, perhaps one can move forward with gene therapy uh, with a clinical trial. And we tested this avenue with the FDA using choroideremia as a model. This is an X-linked recessive disease um, where people have fairly good vision in childhood, uh, except for night blindness. Uh, but they progress, develop progressive visual field loss, and as the, uh, as the um, degeneration uh, approaches the central region of the retina, they lose their central uh, vision as well. And uh, so we tested the ability of AAV to restore activity of, of the enzymatic uh, cascade controlled by uh, the choroideremia gene in these iPS cells and showed that yes, we could increase the levels of activity and also improve the protein trafficking defect, um, which as shown here, these red clumps indicate proteins which in choroideremia patients stay by the nucleus instead of going to the peripheral cytoplasmic locations as shown here. And this, is, this uh, protein trafficking is restored by um, exposing these cells to a recombinant virus carrying the normal choroideremia gene. And so we um, were given the green light by the FDA to proceed with a clinical trial for choroideremia based on this cell data, not animal data. Um, and this trial has uh, progressed now uh, past the one and a half year time point. So the one challenge with this disease is how long will it be to uh, how long will it take to be certain of efficacy? And here um, the, the goals are a little bit different than with the RP65 disease. Here the goal, uh, at least our goal, is to stop disease progression, to allow these people to maintain their central vision until late in the disease, because the rest of the cells have died off. There's nothing left to treat, so we can't restore much vision. And, uh, and I think in many other gene therapy paradigms in the future, this will be the goal, to prevent disease progression. So this is a, a question, how long will it take? Um, the, the group in the UK run by uh, Robert McLaren thinks it will, it will take three and a half years. Um, and um, this may be a good estimate, and for other diseases it may take much longer. So finally, to end on practical issues, how much will an ocular gene therapy drug cost? Um, my husband and I uh, didn't get into this field to, to, uh, um, to worry about people having to mortgage their homes so that they could get treatment for their child. And it's shocking to us hearing some of the discussions about how a treatment might cost half a million dollars per injection. And uh, so there are big questions that will have to be uh, faced about whether insurance will cover the costs, and whether there will be a rebate if the efficacy declines after a certain time and so forth. Um, but this is certainly something that will uh, affect future gene therapies, I think, as well. So my predictions for the next five years are that, um, that there will be at least one approval of a gene therapy reagent for ocular disease, that uh, gene therapy will be shown not only to reverse blindness, but also to prevent disease progression. I'm an optimist, you might guess. Um, that some of the variables affecting outcomes of retinal gene therapy will be characterized and interventions optimized, and that the pipeline will expand. It already is expanding. There are now more than two dozen different targets that people are proposing for additional gene therapy clinical trials. And hopefully the translational process will get less burdensome and less expensive um, in this uh, venture. 
So finally, I'd just like to add my thanks to uh, Dr. Sahel and admiration. Uh, he's a force of nature, and many of you may know that he's uh, going to be setting up a uh, center in Pittsburgh, the home of Troy Palomalu, who's probably the best known person there. His hair has been uh, insured for $1 million by a shampoo company. But my prediction is that Dr. Sahel will revolutionize Pittsburgh and will become the famous person there. And uh, so I'd like to end by acknowledging all of the support we've had as well. Thank you. Thank you.